morning. Welcome to Grace Community Fellowship. It's great to have you on a snowy Sunday morning. Uh, thanks for coming out this morning uh, as we worship the Lord. It's an honor to have you with us this morning. If you're new, uh, just call your attention to our welcome uh, center as you walk. Just as you came in the building, there's connect cards there that you can fill out, and and how somebody will contact you. Just getting more information uh, about the church or ministries, specific ministries that you might be interested in, uh, and so. I uh, hope that you'll take advantage of that, and also, of course, on our website, centralohiograce.com, you can find out a lot of other things that are going on and ministries and about things about the church as well. Just a couple of announcements as we start uh, tonight at 7 is our 180 student ministries at the Marion campus. Again, teens, just uh, keep your phones handy, and we'll see what the weather does, how that turns out, uh, and so that's at 7 tonight, supposed to be. Uh, and then on the 30th, which is next Sunday, uh, we'll be having uh, a pizza and bowling night uh, for the youth. And so we'll be meeting at Payne's Pizza at 6, and then we'll go over, that's in Marion, and then we'll go over to Blue Fusion after that and bowl for a couple hours. Uh, you, you know, the cost is $10. Uh, feel free, that covers bowling, shoes, pizza, all that, and feel free to invite and bring any friends that you would like to, uh, and we're just going to have a, a good, fun night together. And then if you have... Uh, your bulletin, there's a, a sheet, a little insert in there, uh, and that is uh, upcoming Valentine's dinner uh, banquet, and there's tickets that are for sale for that, that you need for that. Uh, the menu's on there. Uh, this is going to help our youth ministry as well uh, as we um, go on a mission trip uh, back to the inner city of Philadelphia and some other things that we'll be doing as a youth ministry. This is to help with those costs, uh, and so uh, you can uh, order tickets out in the foyer or North X, depending on what you call it, out there, that spot where you walked in the building. That's what we're talking about. <laughs> so, uh, but we encourage you to be a part of that. It should be a really fun night and just a great night for you to bring uh, your spouse uh, out to uh, just have a, a fun time together celebrating uh, your love for one another and also helping out our teens. And so there's other things in the bulletin I'd encourage you to, to uh, look at and take advantage of, and let's pray, and we'll continue. Lord, thank you for this day that you have made. Lord, we rejoice and are glad in it. Lord, we are glad today because you're our God and you reign upon the throne, and that we are your people, that you love us, Lord, that you will never leave us or forsake us, uh, no matter what may happen in our lives or in the world. Uh, God, thank you for your loving kindness that your word says is better than life. We are glad today. And, and Lord, I just pray that our hearts will overflow with thankfulness for all that you are and all that you've done, that we might sing and praise you with all our heart and soul, Lord. And I just pray that you'd bless this time and encourage each and every one that's here. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, again, good morning. So would you stand with us and let's praise God for he is just great and he's worthy to be praised.
and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God. You have done great things. You have done great things.
I heard a clap back there. We can praise God with some claps. Yeah, praise God. All right, church, you guys, you all can take a seat, and we'll read the scripture for the day. About that. Today we'll be reading uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, through 12, 1, 4, 1 through 12. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. Because the Lord is an avenger in all of these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you, for God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness... Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that, is indeed, for that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more, and to live, and, and to, live to aspire and live quietly and to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may pr walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for today, and I thank you that we can just come out to church and worship you, and, I'm, and I thank you for all that you've done for us. And I pray that in this sermon you can just, that, that this sermon just glorifies you, and I pray that we can and, it, and I pray that it will help us glorify you throughout our daily lives. I pray that we have a great day, and I pray that um, the sermon goes well. Amen. So we continue on with our worship. A uh, very important part of worship is our opportunity to uh, give back to the Lord and our offerings and tithes. Uh, the, the hymn today is number 448, if you'd like to sing along with the, the various parts, 448 in hymnal, and it's Higher Ground, written by a gentleman named of, uh, Johnson Oatman back around 1900, guy was a retired uh, insurance salesman, also did some pastoring on the side, and wrote 3,000 hymns, uh, probably the other one that you might recognize is Count Your Blessings, but uh, theme for today is, is doing more and more, excelling more for the Lord and uh, pressing on. And that's the way this hymn starts. So um, you can remain seated. We're going to sing Higher Ground. Of glory bright, but still I'll pray. 
Um, so would you stand and we're going to continue to sing this morning. Um, and we're going to do a new song and uh, its, its themes are based on um, God's promises and God's faithfulness. And, um, and in this first verse, it talks about that God is the God of covenants. And so in the Old Testament, we see that God has made covenants to, to Noah, to David, to Moses, and and then finally, in the new, Jesus ushers in the new covenant where we see the forgiveness of our sins through Jesus. And so God has just been faithful to deliver, to promise those things and then to deliver on them. And so because we've seen God be faithful before, we can trust him for the future and we can trust him to lead us, to, to love us, and finally for salvation. So it's kind of a little bit about what this song is about. So let's sing it together.
we thank you that you're faithful. God, we thank you that you're faithful and that you're good to us. Um, God, we pray that that we would just put our faith in you, that that we would be reminded that you're our hope and our firm foundation. And and God, we pray that you would just give us the strength knowing that you're our hope and foundation to just pursue you um, and to pursue Christ-likeness. God, would you give us the strength to do that? um, To to be more like you, to encourage others around us to be more Christ-like. Jesus, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church may be seated and children are dismissed at this time. have your Bibles, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and that's where we'll be this morning. We're going to um, bring in some of three and a little of five as well as we look uh, at this passage uh, this morning. So we're, we've been in this series, Living in Light of His Return. Every chapter in 1 Thessalonians ends with something on the return of Christ. And so Paul speaking to the, this church in Thessalonica that's a strong church, it's been doing well, um, and he's reminding them of things and encouraging them in things of how they need to live in light of Christ's returning. Christ is returning. He reminds them every day of this, I mean every chapter in this, um, and he then teaches them, here's how you need to live because of that. So as we start out, if you turn... Uh, in your Bible, just flip the page back to chapter 3. I just want to point this out. Um, most of 3 is just him telling them that they're doing well. He was afraid, Paul was, that because of the severe persecution the church was under, that they weren't going to make it, that they would fall away from the Lord um, because some of them were dying, um, others were being put in prison. They were suffering greatly, and he didn't know um, whether they would continue or what was going to happen to him. So he was afraid. And he sent Timothy. He said, finally, when I couldn't stand it any longer, I sent Timothy to see how you were doing. And then Timothy brings back a good report. So if you look at verse 6 of chapter 3, but now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us good news of your faith and love and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us just as we also long to see you, For this reason, brethren, in all our distress and affliction, we were comforted about you through your faith. For now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy with which we rejoice before our God on your account? As we night and day keep praying most earnestly that we may see your face and may complete what is lacking in your faith. And so Paul, you know, if you remember when we covered chapter 1, he gave evidences that he knew that they had been born again because of these evidences of what he saw in their life. And then here in chapter 3, he's further encouraged and reminded that they were truly born again because even in the face of persecution, they did not fall away, but they actually were strengthened in their faith. And this is something that we see all through the history of the church for 2,000 years. When the church is persecuted and under affliction, it grows strong. So when the Iron Curtain, before the Iron Curtain was lifted, people wondered, did the church survive there? Because the persecution was so great. And when the Iron Curtain was finally lifted uh, many years ago, they not only saw that the church was alive, but it was strong and it had thrived. 
even in the face of persecution. And so that's something that we see uh, again and again. And so Paul has been encouraged. And then in in chapter 4, verse 1, he tells them, Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from from us instruction as, as how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you ex- excel still more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. And then he goes on into that. So the first thing, and he says this twice in our passage, to excel still more. So this is, you know, as, as Paul comes here to chapter 4, he's encouraging them. And he even says the two verses I just read. You've had this instruction from the Lord, and you've been walking in it. You've been doing it. You're doing well. But he says, but don't stop. I want you to excel still more. So you think about it this way. You know, the Olympics are getting ready to start, and, and you know, I love watching the, the Winter Olympics as well as the summer, but in the winter, you know, you have the downhill skiers, and it's, it's amazing to watch them uh, and, and how fast they're going. And, you know, if you think about a skier in, in, in the Olympics, if they're headed down the, the, uh, the mountain and they're doing well, I mean, they're just flying. And what would happen if they get halfway down and they go, you know what, I'm just kind of tired. I think I'm just going to stop and rest a while. Uh, what would happen with them in the race? Would they win? They'd lose, right? They, they, they have to continue. They have to finish. You can think about that in any kind of sport. You know, it's, a, it's just a great analogy. Or you think of a runner running a race that you can be doing well and then just go, well, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of tired. I just feel like I think I'm going to do something else for a while. You, you can't win that way, right? And so Paul, he tells them, you're doing well. You're walking according to the stru- instruction of Christ that we've given you, but I don't want you to quit, I want you to excel even more. I want you to continue and and not just stay where you are, but go further, go higher. Uh, The the hymn we sang, Higher Ground. So he says, we've taught you the commands of Jesus, and you're doing them, but excel more. And the word excel more means to abound, to overflow, to be extraordinary. So Paul didn't want them to just be mediocre, he doesn't want them to just, well, here's the commands that we gave you at first, and, you know, well, we're doing those, and so we're just going to do just enough to get by. That, that's not what he's telling them. He's telling them, I want you to press on, to, to, to go further, to be extraordinary in how you follow Christ, and so excel still more. So as we look at this passage, I want you to notice a couple of key things here in just the first two verses. He says, you receive from us instruction, I'm sorry, we exhort you in the Lord Jesus, that's the first one, in the Lord Jesus, and that as you received from us instruction has how you ought to walk and please God that you actually, and you actually do walk that way, the please God and in the Lord Jesus. I want you to just key in on those for a moment as we think about what he's telling them to excel still more. It's not just you know, like some religious duty that I, you know, in some religions like Islam, you know, the more you sacrifice, you're supposed to gain more with God. And so, you know, I've, I've told the story before of, of a father that was on his way to Mecca with his son, and he thought that if he stabbed his son in the back and murdered him, that that would gain him points with Allah. And so he murdered his son on the way, thinking that somehow that would gain him uh, points with Allah. And so Paul's not talking about just doing more or, or you know, trying to sacrifice more because that will gain you something with God. That's not what he's focusing on here. And as we think about spiritual progress, excelling uh, as a follower of Christ, the motivation is key. And notice here the motivation that we, they exhorted them in the Lord Jesus and, and walking in a way to please God. They want to please the Lord. And so if they want to please the Lord, that means that there's a, a love there. They care about what God thinks. It's not, well, God will be mad at me if I don't do this. I mean, I can't tell you how many people, you know, either 
come to churches or think that's what church is about is, well, I can't do this and I got to do that and it's a bunch of rules and a big list. That's not what it's about. Christianity is about Christ, that we love Christ, the one who came and died and paid for our crimes and set us free so that we can live for God. And one day when we walk off this planet, we'll have eternity with him forever, face to face with the living God for all eternity. And it's about Christ. And so many, so many times people miss in all these things that they think we're supposed to do. They miss Christ. And Paul here, as he's telling them to excel still more, he's reminding them that we gave you instruction in the Lord Jesus. This is from Christ. And, and we want you to walk in a way, live in a way that pleases God because you love him. And, and that's a key point that in this spiritual progress, that it, the, desi- the motivation is a desire to know and love God. And, and so spiritual progress here is what we would say the theological word is sanctification. And he'll use that here uh, in 3 and 4. He'll mention the word sanctification. Um, justification, that's another theological word, is the word for when you repent and trust in Christ and you're born again. When you're initially saved, that's called justification. You're justified in God's sight. It's a legal term that you've, you're, you're justified in his sight. Sanctification is that process of growing as a Christian. You've been saved, you know the Lord, now you're growing as a believer. That's the word sanctification. It's the process of being separated from sin and set apart to God. Okay, so it's a process. That's a key word as well. When you're saved, you're not perfect after that, right? Your heart has been changed, you're changed within, but you're still not perfect. We still mess up. We still sin at times. But sanctification is that process of God making you like Christ, where he's separating you more and more from a sinful life and setting you more and more apart to God, where you begin to live like Christ. You look different than the world. And that is that word, sanctification. And so a couple passages here as we think about the motivation for why we want to excel. In Psalm 42, 1, it says, As the deer pants for the water... So my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Notice he said, he doesn't say, my soul thirsts for me to gain all these things from you, God. My soul thirsts for the living God. I want to know him. See, that's what Paul said in Philippians 3 when he was talking to the Philippian church. He said, all the great things that I've done in this life, he said, they're all rubbish, They all mean nothing compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I've suffered the loss of all things. And see, that people, we forget sometimes that knowing Christ is greater than anything else in the universe. That God says in his word that, Lord, your loving kindness is better than life. See, the the problem is, is we don't, know the Lord, either don't know the Lord that well, or we don't know him at all. If we think the things of the world are greater than knowing Christ, then we don't know him, and at least don't know him very well. Because when you begin to walk with Christ and know him, there's nothing like it. I mean, what he does in your soul as he restores it, and to walk with him and know him and and actually have a relationship with the living God, there's nothing like it. I, I can testify to that. Of all the things. And that's what Paul said in Philippians 3. He's like, I've done all these things. I have all these successes. And none of them compares, not not even close, to knowing Christ. And, And so that's the motivation that Paul's trying to key in on here for the Thessalonians. You're doing well, and I want you to press on, excel, abound. Don't stop because of Christ. Another passage here is in Jeremiah 9. Thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, and let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord. If we're going to boast in anything, we boast, I know the Lord. I know him. It's not some religious thing. It's not some thing that just, we just say, um, because that's what Christians are supposed to say. 
do you know him? Do you know the Lord? When you know him, there's nothing else like him. And that's for sure. And that's what Paul's saying. So out of that, pursue him, excel. Spiritual progress is not only motivated, our, our sanctification is not only motivated by a desire to know God, but his progress is empowered by the indwelling Christ. And if you think about Galatians 2.20, Paul says it to the Galatian church this way, I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but what? Christ lives in me. Just think about that for a minute. <laughs> the God who created all things. You know, that's what salvation is. The life of God in the soul of man. It's not a prayer you pray. It's not something you do. Salvation is God putting his life, his spirit within you. And Paul said to the Galatians, I've been crucified with Christ. That means my flesh has died. My old self, the things I used to love, it's died with Christ on the cross. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. That means that my, the trajectory of my life is Christ. I follow him. That's what my life is about now. And Christ is within me, empowering me to live that way. And then he goes on, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. And so now my life, because Christ is in me, he's empowering me to do his will. See, and that's one of the things, and that, that, that's what's so important as we think about excelling still more, as we think about growing in the Lord. It's so important that we don't forget that it's not just, okay, I put my faith in Christ, and now i got to grit my teeth, pull myself up by my bootstraps, and just try to do this. That's not how it is. The effort is into knowing Christ. The pursuit, the, the, um, the, the tenacity of your life, the energy that you're pursuing, that you're using as a Christian is to know him. And the closer you draw to Christ, the more that you submit your life to Christ, the more that his life within you takes over and empowers you to live the way he's calling you to live. See, sometimes we think, I just got to grit my teeth and just try really hard, and I try hard, and I keep messing up, and I can never do this, and, and we're missing Christ. You can't be good enough. You can't do everything that God wants you to do. You just can't. It's impossible. And, and that's why we need a Savior, right? Amen? And so the pursuit and, and the, the goal of your life is not to do all these things. It's to love and know Christ. And as you know him and draw close to him, he empowers you to live and do the things he's called you to do. The things that, those things that he wants you to do, those things he doesn't want you to do, his life within you empowers you to be able to live that way. But we can't live that way without him. It's impossible. I've tried. A lot of other people have tried. One of the great uh, evangelists of the church age, um, George Whitfield, he tried so hard on his own to do all the things he was supposed to in the Bible, he almost killed himself. He almost died trying to do it. And then he finally, he was almost at the point of death, and he realized that you're saved by grace through faith, not through your works, by trusting and resting in Christ and he was born again at that moment, and it radically changed his life. And he was, he was a guy that would memorize the Bible in their original languages, in Greek and Hebrew. When he was lost, he was trying to earn his way to God. Martin Luther, the same way, same thing. Almost drove himself insane and to death, trying to be good enough, and he finally realized, I can't. You're saved by grace through faith in Christ and so Christ is who motivates us and empowers us to live this way. And then in verse 3, he goes on, and, he, and he, there's two things he's going to tell us to excel in. He's going to tell us here to excel in holiness and how we live. And he's going to tell us to excel in how we love one another. Those are the two things that he tells us here. So look with me in verse 3. He says, they gave you this by the authority of Jesus, verse 3, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. Now he's going to define what he's talking about in our sanctification. That is that you abstain from sexual immorality. Uh-oh. 
that each of you know how to possess his own vessel or body, his sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, and that no man transgress and defraud his brother in, the matter, in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger in all things, just as we told you before and solemnly warned you, for God has called us for the purpose of impurity, but in, sanct- but in sanctification." So he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. So then Paul tells them to excel in how they're walking in holiness. That's the sanctification. And he he keys in on here on sexual immorality. Man, do we need to hear that in America or what? Right? So holiness, and this is important, comes from obedience to God's commands. So look back at 3.13 or just look up, he says, so that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus. At the coming of Christ, he wants our hearts established in holiness. The word holiness, all that means is to be set apart. Like if you take a steak and you cut a piece of the steak off and you separate it from the rest of the steak, that word holy That's what it means, to cut and separate. And so, as you think about being holy, God wants you to be set apart from the world. He has cut you out and removed you from being like the world to be like Christ. Does that make sense? That's what the word holiness means. Righteousness means purity. Righteousness means you are doing what's right. Holiness means you are set apart. So how you live in righteousness is what sets you apart in holiness. Does that make sense? Hopefully that's not confusing. But that's what he's getting at here, and that's what he's talking about in the first two verses of chapter 4 as well. And so he goes into the things to be holy is to abstain from sexual immorality. What does the word abstain mean? Not something we know of in America. (laughs) Abstain means total abstinence. That's not real, really a great, uh, fun word in, in America, is it? I mean, in America, it's like, if it feels good, do it, right? As long as you don't hurt anybody, just do it, whatever, you, whatever feels good. Why should anybody tell me I can't do something? Like, that's un-American, right? But that's not what Paul's saying. Look, what he, look at verse 3 again. This is the will of God, your sanctification, your growth, be set apart in holiness. And what is he going to key in on? That you abstain from sexual immorality. Now, I want to tell you something. This is important. The church has not done its job in teaching people about what sex is. And God created it. And he created it to be good. And he created it to be fun. And he created it to be in the bounds of marriage. Anything outside of biblical marriage, one man and one woman that are committed to each other, anything outside of that, and making the vow to be married, that means living together, is sexual immorality. It's when a man and woman commit, they make a vow, they're married, they pledge. That is what God says is biblical marriage. Anything outside of that is sexual immorality. That means pornography. That means living together. That means anything that's outside of that is sexual immorality. God created sex to be good, but he created it with parameters. Because when you get outside of those parameters, what does it do? It destroys you. I mean, if if you have experienced or you know someone who has experienced someone who's cheated on them with somebody else... That's devastating, isn't it? Right? That's why God gave us this. He's trying to keep us from destroying ourselves. And the only thing that comes from sexual immorality is you get STDs, right? Those come from that. And you have depression and hurt and all kinds of terrible things. Rape, human trafficking, all that comes from sexual immorality. And God is saying, this is how, how I, why I made it, and, th- and it's to be good, but I made it with the parameters of marriage to protect you and to bring glory to me. And the church has not done a good job at all 
about teaching on this. It's terrible. We, it's in the Bible everywhere. <laughs> we should teach it. And that's one of the things when you teach through the Bible, you're going to hit everything. And this is one. So if you have your Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians 6. This passage, I didn't want to have to type it out. And so I'm going to just have us turn there. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 15. If you'll turn there in your Bibles. Paul says to the Corinthian church, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says the two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. You know what that word flee means in the Greek? It means run away. It means to flee. Like, you get out of town. You literally run away from sexual immorality. Every other sin, verse 18, that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? You have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Now this is important. Corinth, where we just read, and Thessalonica were wicked, gross, sexually immoral cities. Paul's not writing to Christians that are in a Christian nation. He's writing to Christians that have been that have lived in sexual immorality. And when you read 1 Corinthians 6, it says, you know, some of you were homosexuals. Some of you were fornicators. That's having sex outside of marriage, living that way. He, some of you, I mean, there's, back in these days in, in Thessalonica and Corinth, they had transgenders. Transgenders is not new. I mean, there's passages in the Old Testament about that. It, it, Man doesn't, we just do the same things over and over and over. We don't come up with anything new. Homosexuality, transgender, all that stuff, there's nothing new. It's all happened before and God has spoken to it. And these cities that that Paul's speaking to, telling them to come out and live differently and to abstain from sexual immorality, they grew up and lived in a place that was gross immorality. In Thessalonica, with the the temple prostitutes, the temples for the different religions, they would hire thousands of prostitutes. And part of the religious worship were sexual orgies with the prostitutes. That's how these people grew up. And Paul, they, they came to Christ, and Paul saying, I don't want you to go back in that. I want you to abstain from all sexual immorality. That is not of God. And I want you, as you're following me and living this way, to excel still more that you abstain from all sexual immorality. That's what, I mean, so think about it. It's not like everybody around them was living this way. Nobody was living this way. I mean, to say that the only person that you're going to have sex with is your wife That's like stupid and and ridiculous. Like, who would do that? That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. That's what the society was like. And that's a lot how America is today, isn't it? I mean, you got to at least live with somebody a few years so you can tell if you're compatible, right? That's not of God. You won't find that anywhere in here. And so... Paul is clear as he's telling them to grow in their sanctification. He's calling them out in the midst of a a wicked society and saying, you need to live differently and don't be involved in that. And he's going to have some pretty strong words to make sure that they understand. But, you know, this is so important for us. And here's a a few passages. We look, look what... The writer Hebrews says, marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. 
marriage, and that's between one man and one woman who are committed in marriage, that is to be held in honor. It's to be lifted up and praised as this is good and right and what we should strive for. This is what we should do. What is it today? I don't know how you feel about presidents, but you know, when Obama came in and covered the White House with rainbow colors and, and brought in the, you know, we're going to change, redefine marriage. Look at what's happened to America since then. You can't do that kind of thing and not bring the judgment of God on a country. You just can't. And so here we have a president. I mean, think about it. In, in all the history of mankind, other kingdoms and nations that were, were terribly gross, wickedly, never redefined marriage. That's something that we did. And, and we, instead of marriage being honored, we brought it down and made it filthy and disgusting. It didn't matter if you're married. Who cares about being married? Or you can marry whatever. I mean, now we're, you know, calling ourselves, you know, high schools around here. Well, I'm, you know, I'm not really a person. I'm a wolf. Or I'm a pig. I mean, we have gone totally unhinged. Why? Because we have walked away from the truth and the light of God, and we have plunged ourselves into wickedness. And when you do that, you will destroy yourself. Rome is a great picture. Rome is no more the nation of Rome. And they did exactly what America is doing. You know, today, one of the big things with teens is being pansexual. That means that I can have a sexual relationship with a uh, man, woman, uh, animal, uh, object, whatever. That's the new thing now. Well, if I love, I just love everything. Do you see that, you know, when homosexuality came into America... You know, when, when it started to be, you know, and they did it through comedy, which is how it's always been done through the history of man. You bring it in through comedy, get people to laugh at it, and they'll accept it. And it started with Ellen, her show. Now, homosexuality, that's not even a big deal anymore. Notice the downward spiral. And there's other things that, I'm, that are going on that I won't even talk about in this setting. We have plunged ourselves into wickedness. And, and that's the society that the Thessalonica church was in. And Paul is telling them as you're following Christ that sexual purity is of God and it's important and hold marriage high and honor it. Because anything outside of that, God will judge it. And notice to the point, what, notice what Jesus says. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus takes it, it's not just the action. If you lust in your heart or mind, if you see someone and you have impure sexual lust for them, that is the same thing as committing the act of adultery in God's eyes. So, pornography fits the bill, right? I mean, I know this is probably not what you expected to hear when you came this morning, but hey, we're just going through God's word, right? This is what God says. Jesus said this 2,000 years ago. If you lust in your heart and mind after a person, you are committing sexual immorality in your mind. And Paul says, don't do it. Abstain. That's why we need Jesus, right? I've talked to people, when I'm witnessing to people on the streets, and they're like, there's no way anybody can do that. That's right. With Christ, it's the only way you can. Because <laughs> without him, there's no way you can do that. We need a Savior. We need Christ. But that's God's standard. And then in Ephesians 5.3, Paul says, but immorality or impurity or greed. Greed is not an outward, it's an inward must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. To the Colossians, Paul said, For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body, that's your body, as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. 
God takes it further than just our outward actions and to what's happening within us. The motive of our heart, our thought life, all of that, God sees it all. And see, do you see now why you need a Savior? There's no way to possibly be able to to never do that without Christ. That's why we need Jesus, because nobody can live that good on their own. But that's the standard of God, and that's why we need a Savior. And Paul's calling them to live this way. And that would mean living totally different from everyone around them. Totally different. And some of them, it cost, you know, it cost them their lives. See, if you didn't engage in the pagan worship, which involved temple prostitutes, you could die because you're not worshiping the right God. You see the dilemma that Christians were put in? I could lose my job if I don't do this. We, we studied Thyatira today in Sunday school, and that, was, that city was the, like, like unions are here in America. Their guilds were like unions. And the only way you could have a job is you had to in, be involved in those pagan worships, worship services. And that involves sexual immorality. So Christians were in a big predicament. Am I going to follow Christ, or am I going to follow the world? So this, is, this was not something that was easy for these churches to do. It was much more difficult than it is for us today, but that's what he called them to. Think about this. Whatever happened to teaching our children about abstinence? You know, I was reading an article by a, a, a person that works in the, the uh, public school system, and they were talking about pornography and that there's no need, you know, no, nobody's not going to do that. And so even though it's really bad and it, it really degrades women, we should just teach them how to look at pornography correctly. It's like, are you kidding me? Really? You know, and, and haven't we done that, the same thing? Well, we know kids are all going to have sex, so let's, we might as well not even teach abstinence. But you know what? I can guarantee you, if you practice abstinence as a, as a teenager, you won't get STDs. You know that? You can't, <laughs> right? And you won't marry someone that has STDs. Because if you abstain, you aren't going to have those. You also aren't going to rip your heart apart. And the Bible says, guard your heart, for it's the wellspring of life. When you give yourself to someone sexually, we just read, the two shall become one. And when that, when that guy just walks away and he got what he wanted, and he walks away and it just rips your heart apart. It destroys people. People commit suicide over it. People do terrible things to themselves because they've, they've committed this immorality. They've given their hearts and they've given their bodies and it has totally degraded them. And, and women do things that are, that, that are just, it's, it's, it breaks your heart. That, that they've allowed them, they've become so run down. Because, I mean, guys can just be terrible, right? They are, man. There's some guys, they're just punks. You know, and, and it's, it's, that's not, you know, and that's the thing we don't, we don't realize. The Bible upheld women and, and wanted people, to, wanted men to treat them with honor and respect and not just as some, some object for me to get a thrill, like a piece of meat or something. But that's how, that's how society, and, and look, at, look at what's going on in our, in our society. It degrades people. And, and God wants us to be pure and holy because that brings honor to him, but also to us. And it keeps us from destroying ourselves. I mean, I can't tell you how many teens and how many people that I've counseled with that are just a wreck because of what's been done to them. I mean, you want to stop human trafficking? Then stop sexual immorality and it won't happen. You see, it's like we come to this tree and we want to, this tree, you know, the apple tree is like coming to it and go, well, I'm going to kill the tree and just pick all, by picking all the apples off. Well, that's, they're just going to grow back. And we think with human traffic or something like that, well, if we just do all these things, it's going to solve it. No, it's not. You have to get to the heart of the issue. And the heart of the issue is sexual immorality. 
And you deal with that. That's why the gospel, Jesus didn't come in to be a, a, you know, a king and reign over Rome. And everybody was mad because he didn't come in and destroy Rome. He came in to change the hearts of people. Because when you change someone's heart, you change their life. And see, in changing someone's heart and calling people out of the sexual immorality, they would treat their wives better. Their wives wouldn't be beaten. Their wives wouldn't be abused sexually, right? Other women wouldn't be. I mean, the slave trade, all that was, they were, women were just objects during this time. And Paul and the church, because of Christ, are trying to uphold and honor women and say, look, they are the same. In Christ, you are one. And, and so w- sometimes we look at this as this list of do's and don'ts, and God's like, no, it's so much more than that. And this is so important that we understand what God's trying to do here. And he's trying to heal, bring healing in people's lives. And, and, you know, in Ephesians 5, Paul's talking about a husband loving his wife as Christ loved the church, giving himself up for her. I mean, how many wives would love for their husbands to do that? And wives, show your husbands respect. How many husbands would love that, Right? Because God knows us. But then in that, he says, but I'm speaking to you about Christ and the church. But see, when we commit sexual immorality, we blaspheme the gospel. And we blaspheme what Christ did on the cross. Christ died and rose again to rescue us out of immorality to show us the the love that God has for his people. Marriage is a picture of forgiveness, of love that goes through no matter what trials, no matter what is faced. We love one another. We're committed in spite of whatever comes against us. And yes, we're going to hurt one another, and we forgive one another. And marriage is to be the picture of Christ and the church, God's love for his people to the world. And when we get involved and we live our lives in sexual immorality, it blasphemes what Christ did on the cross. Because that's to be a sex in marriage. That's why it's supposed to be in marriage. Because it's to be a picture of God's passionate love for his people. And that he's committed to us. That he forgives. That he strives with us. Even when we fail. Even when we do terrible things. He doesn't He doesn't walk away, and he loves us in spite of ourselves. And so Paul goes on here in 1 Thessalonians 4, and he says, then he goes to the next thing is that we are to possess our own body in sanctification and honor. This is verse 4. And to possess here his vessel or body, it just means that you control your body. You have mastery over your body. That's un-American, isn't it? I mean, America's like, feels good, do it. You know, let's just do whatever and see what happens. And God says, no, I want you to possess. I want you to have control over your body. I mean, again, think about the Olympics. Think about an athlete, like a world-class athlete. Do they just go, hey, whatever, you know, who cares? I'm just going to eat whatever I want. I'm going to go out and party all the time, and I'm not going to have any discipline in my life. Well, they won't ever be in the Olympics. I can promise you that, right? It's just impossible. Someone who is a a world-class athlete, they control their body. They make their body do terrible things in training and how they eat and all that. It's not fun, right? And, and And so Paul's saying, as he's telling them to grow and to abstain from sexual immorality and to grow in sanctification, we need to learn how to control our bodies, to possess our own vessel and not let it control us. That's so important that we understand. And and again, it's a process. It's not easy. 1 Corinthians 9, 27, Paul says, But I discipline my body, and I make it my slave, so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified. The word discipline there in the Greek means to hit yourself under the eye. That's what it literally reads. And, and what, what that was for was to hit yourself under the eye, was to knock out all your bodily impulses. It's basically like a knockout punch. And so Paul's saying, I discipline my body. 
I hit myself under the eye and knock out my bodily in, impulses, and I look what he says, and I make my body my slave. I'm in control. My body's not controlling me. me. I control it. I don't just give in to whatever temptations or passions or lusts that my body wants to do. I am master over it. That's what Paul says, so that I won't be disqualified. And so, again, if biblical sex is within biblical marriage, and that's what honors God and the gospel of Jesus, and that's why Paul is telling this. And the next thing he goes on in verse 5, to be holy is to act like a Christian, not like a Gentile. Now, you and I are Gentiles. A Gentile is someone who's not a Jew. But here, what, when he says Gentile here, that's referring to someone who does not know God, the nations. And so he's not, he's not saying if you're not a Jew, but someone who acts like a Gentile, an unbeliever. And again, I want you to just point you to America. We are unhinged in this country with sex. It is just totally unhinged. It's just whatever. I mean, people are doing terrible things and go, hey, you know, I just love that animal. I just love that whatever. I mean, that's not love, people, right? I hope we know that. I hope we see that. And so Paul says, don't act in this lustful passion, he says here, like the Gentiles. The word lustful passion means out of control cravings. It means uncontrollable desires. Don't live that way. And those, I mean, again, our bodies, you know, there's temptations, right? And we're made, um, you know, again, God made sex, and he made us to be attracted to one another, male and female. And, and there's these desires that we have, but he's telling us, control yourself. Don't just live like the people that don't know God who just give themselves to uncontrollable desires and passionate lusts like heathen. Be master over your body. Be in control. Don't live like that. And in Galatians 5.24, Paul tells the Galatians, he says, Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Crucify, what does that mean? Nail it to a cross and kill it. Paul said, told the Galatians, the Christian is to take those uncontrollable desires and by the life of Christ in us, put them to death. Not let them control us. Does that make sense? And that's how he's telling them, press on. And then the, the last thing here is he says, to be holy is not to take advantage of and sin against other people for sex. That's verse 6. And he also says here, be warned, the Lord is the avenger. See, when we, and, and what he's saying here is when we take advantage of someone, manipulate someone for sexual pleasure, we're going to take advantage of this person because I want some, them to do something for me so I get something. And I'm just going to walk away and don't care. Paul says, don't do that. Don't take advantage of someone for sex. The word defraud there means to selfishly, greedily take something for personal gain and pleasure at someone else's expense. How many guys have done that to, to girls and they've lost their virginity? That's what he's talking about. And look what he says. The Lord is the avenger. God takes that serious. We may not, but he does. And he says, the Lord will avenge. That means he comes in judgment. God is serious about his people. And, and I, you know, if you're a teenage girl here, I want to tell you something. You are the Lord's. And he loves you. Don't let some guy take advantage of you so he can get some thrill. You're a, if you know the Lord, you're a daughter of the living God. And you have great value. And don't let somebody just take that and just make it filth. That's why God says he's the avenger. Because you are taking advantage 
of someone that he created in his image for his glory. And he takes it serious and he will not leave it unchecked. And it is high time the church start preaching the word of God and saying what God says about this thing of sex in our country. Because we need to hear the truth. And, and, and young people need to hear the truth that they are valuable to God. And God wants them to have a good marriage that is fun and wonderful and that brings him glory and that they love and enjoy and have a bond with a, a person of the opposite sex for life. That's God's desire for you because that is good. And that is healthy. Not just physically, but mentally and spiritually as well. Don't defraud someone and take advantage of them. Believers are warned here to be holy, sexually pure, because God himself will take vengeance on those who don't. God's purpose for us is moral purity. This is what's best and honors God. And if we reject this, Look what it says there, verse 8. He who rejects this is not rejecting man, but God. You can listen to this sermon and go, you know what? Yeah, Pastor Joe got all whatever and said all that, and I don't care. Well, you're not rejecting me. You're rejecting God is what he says. This is not my opinion. This is what God's word says, and it's the truth. The God who gives his Holy Spirit to you, and that's one of the keys here to remind you this morning, God gives you his spirit. If you're a believer in Christ, the indwelling Christ within you, God puts his spirit in you to give you what's needed to live this way. He doesn't call you to do something he's not going to give you the power to do. Some people don't do this because they've never heard it. And pastors are going to give an account for not preaching the word of God. Some people in churches don't know because they've never heard, because the pastor's not doing his job, for one. But, but again, this is so important. God has given you his spirit. That's why when Jesus left the earth, he sent the Holy Spirit to indwell his people to give us power to live according to how he wants us to live. And, and so he, he's given us that, this power. To do this, that's the Spirit of God within us. Again, salvation is the life of God in the soul of man. It's not just some religious duty. And, and you know, I'm, we were, I was going to cover verse 9, but I'm out of time. So I, I'm, I'm on 40 seconds over here. So I'm out of time, but I, I want to, so we're going to cover, we'll cover later the love of the brother. And that's the second thing Paul gets into. And I was praying through this whole week, like, I don't know if I can get all this in one message, but I, I really felt like as I prayed that this, you know, with sexual immorality, it's so important. Because I'm sure every one of us, most of us in here know um, what the devastation of what can happen in our lives through sexual immorality. And, and the the Sexual immorality is a powerful master, but Christ is greater. Amen? And again, please understand with this thing with abstinence and, and living God's way, it, one, it's, a, it's right and it glorifies God, but two, he's he given you this because for your own good, for your own health, for the health of your children, for the health of your, your own marriage. And, I mean, there's so much devastation in our country. I mean, think of all the kids and, and what's happened to them and how many kids don't have a mom and dad at home, right? It's hard. And, and, and God's desire, and I, I don't say that to, to look down on you or anything if, if, you, if you're one of those or if you're a, a single mom or something this morning. I mean, because there's a lot of single moms around working hard to take care of their kids because dad is just a punk, Right? And so I, I tell you that, that you know that God desires what's good for you, and he knows you, and he loves you. And, and so this is not about him trying to, you know, crimp your style or, you know, or make you have a, do something that's no fun. He, he wants it to be what's best. And so as Paul, you know, in closing this morning, as Paul encourages the believers, you're doing well. 
You know, I want to encourage you all. You know, in the two years I've been here, we've made some big steps, haven't we? And there's, and there's been a lot of change. It hasn't been easy, right? And you're doing well. You know, we're, we're stepping out in faith. We're trusting God. We're trying to follow the Lord and stay on his mission and tell others about Christ. You're doing well, but don't stop. Excel still more. And this first one, the, the next one we'll get into is loving the brethren and loving one another and the love inside the church. But this one, you know, not only for you, but maybe it's your kids or your grandkids. They need to learn God's design for sex and marriage because it will save so much devastation. And so excel still more. Don't stop, saints. Keep pressing on because the Lord loves you and he has what's best for you and it's good. Amen? Ben, if you'll come up and we'll close here this morning. Will you join me in prayer? Father God, we love you and we thank you for your word. Lord, my heart breaks for kids and what's been done to them. God, I pray that we'll be an example of purity that will hold forth the truth of what sex and marriage is all about. That our, our, our own marriages and lives will be an example. Lord, I think of the kids right here and in Delaware and Marion and Waldo and Prospect, these towns, and, and Lord, what's been done to some of these kids is horrific. What they've had to see and live through and experience is wrong. God, I pray that you will help us to be that example and in our own lives to excel, Lord, to, to abstain from sexual immorality, but Lord, also to help others that have been devastated by this. And Lord, I, I just, I, I praise you for your grace that even with the Thessalonians, you called them out of that life. Many of them had been in that, all of this stuff, and you called them out and made them new. And Lord, I pray this morning that you would do that in our lives, and that you would use us to do that, Lord, in this community, in the surrounding communities in which we live. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand, sing, and respond with us this morning? In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt praise the father praise the son praise the spirit three
that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe for the soul. truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. with you. I know in a, in a group even this size, there's people here and I don't, I don't know who you are, I don't know your backgrounds and things, but I know in a crowd this size, there's people that have been devastated by something sexually in their lives. Things have been done to you or you've been involved in things that are devastating. And I want you to know that there is healing in Christ. Christ died and rose again so that you could be healed from those things. The Thessalonians are such a great example of people that that's, that's what they lived in. That's what they had grown up in. They had all these terrible things had been done to them and they had been involved in all this sexual immorality and God saved them out of that and he healed them. And I want you to know there's healing in Christ. It's not some list of do's and don'ts and, and if, if you've have that in your life or you currently have that in your life, then go to Christ. Call out to him because he died to set you free. He died to heal you of those hurts that, that a psychologist and all that cannot heal. Only Christ can heal those wounds. And he loves you. He loves you. And please turn to him and let him heal you as only he can. There is no one who can heal like Jesus Christ. He's alive and he loves you. Lord, we praise you this morning. And God, I pray for all of us here. Lord, one that will take this truth of your word and will hold it forth and show people what you say. But Lord, also that, Lord, if, if we are involved in something or something's happened to us in the past, Lord, that we will right now call upon your name cry out to you, Lord Jesus, and Lord, take your word and, and begin to seek you out, and Lord, talk to others and, and find help, because Lord, you bring healing. For those who have been hurt and devastated, you can heal anyone to the utmost. You can make us new. And I pray, Lord, that people will find that healing in you today. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.